I have a debate with my buddy mm. on how you play a certain song that they've been asking you about, and I just wanted to see how you do it. What? Lust for Life. That's right. That's what you want. Is uh, it on the floor, Tom? Is it on the kick? What's the swing? How and the how it. did you do that? I haven't that? played it in a while. I don't see right. I'm playing Lust for Life. That sound like it? That did. Okay, that's yeah. how it's done. Armed Forces Radio in Germany had this tr drum beat. Beep, 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 with this crazy beat. And then I took that, and I took George of the Jungle, the cartoon <laughs> thing. Man. You Can't Hurry Love, the Supremes. Yeah. yeah. Wrapped it all up and then made it my bag. Nice. Okay, I, I, at least I'm honest. I'll tell you where, you know. I used to watch George of the Jungle when I was a kid. George, well, that, George, uh, George, George of the bit. Jungle, George, the George, same, George of well, the Jungle. Well, go listen to it again, and then you'll go lost for life. <laughs> Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvelously well. It is another incredibly hot day here in sunny Los Angeles. Sunny's an understatement. It is about, well, was it 110 somewhere in LA area yesterday? <gasps> Sweltering. Luckily not too humid, but just humid enough to be freaking hot. So talking of hot, we've got Hunt Sales today. Hunt Sales is a freaking legend. He played drums on Lust for Life. Yep. Dum, 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 dum. That drum beat, that iconic drum beat. But he's much more than that. He was the drummer for Iggy, yes. He was also the drummer, of course, with Debbie Bowie and Tin Machine. His career is huge. And of course, the Sales Brothers with his brother, Tony. Thing I didn't know is that when he was, I still believe, a teenager, he played with Todd Rundgren on Something Anything. So this guy is insanely talented. He's got a lot of stories. So stay tuned for the great hunt sales. So you start playing at 11. Yeah. Start playing drums? Drums at 11, is that no. correct? When did you start? Six. Six. Wow. Look, here's what got me playing drums. Not the Beatles. And my notes say, Buddy Rich, Louis Bellin, and Shelley Mann. Is that correct? Are those, are those yeah, but the guy that, got, that I saw and I went, I want to do that was Earl Palmer. Oh, wow. Okay, and if anyone knows who Earl Palmer is, badass. I saw him, it was one of those sessions at Capitol. My dad did these records, comedy, whatever, singing, bullshit. And this guy was there and man, that was cool. I didn't want to be a comedian. That's why I don't, you know, I didn't want to be a comedian. And I can tell a joke or two, you know what I mean? But um, no, I went the musician route. I had to go out and make my own way. You know what I mean? I'm not Frank Sinatra Jr. I'm not, I'm Hunt Jr. It's time to get serious because uh, who are my male figures? For me, what sets you apart probably from other drummers that played in bands that we now call like punk or, or anything like that is that you really are a, a player. You're a player's player. Well, You're a great... I, play, I was in Las Vegas show bands, okay? People don't know that. I played jazz for quite a few years over at Compton at Sportsman's Bowl, which is way, way out there near first, uh, Goodyear or whatever. You know, Hammond organ, Jimmy Smith music. That's, I studied and did that for several years. I said, fuck rock and roll. Now I grew up on Al Jackson and, and the Memphis shit as a, as a little boy. I love that shit. And that, that Buddy Miles, yeah, Buddy Miles and Al Jackson, besides Buddy Rich and, and they, that other world. But as a kid, I, I, ha I probably still have some of those records in storage, you know, that I bought, knock on wood and all, you know what I mean? All, all, all that soul stuff. I used to go to the Apollo when I was 12 years old, you know what I mean? And I'd be hanging out at the Apollo, seeing James Brown do incredible shows. Now, I don't know who else was 12 years old, 11 years old, hanging out at the Apollo. I was, and it was groovy, and I also was hanging out at Count Basie shows in Duke Ellington, because they were still going. See, my fantasy, and you know how fantasies are, they can be really strange and not true, and what the fantasies 
was to play with Duke Ellington's band or, or Count Basie's band. That's what I wanted to do. But, you know, I did the organ jazz shit, studied, and I come from rock and roll. But it doesn't mean I can't put my influence into rock and roll. You know what I mean? That, that The swing, the, um, the shit that those bands, the, the great drummers did. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, I brought a little bit of that sense, I think, I believe, that sensibility in rock and roll. How did you get to join Runt in 1970? Todd Rundgren, how did that happen? I ran it, I used to hang out at a club called Steve Paul's Scene. Because you're only, what, 16 then? I'm 15. 15. And I got my shades on and some chick, she do my hair so I look like cream, you know, with the afro. That was big, I have my hair done, I have my shades on, my velvet shit, the boots. They let me in. I run into Todd, someone introduces us. My brother happened to be there that night. We get up and jam. It clicks. It, it's one, you know, you play with someone, it clicks. Man, he says, I left the NAS, I'm doing my first solo album. You guys want to do it? We said, yeah. Now, I kind of knew of him from the NAS. But I, you know, I didn't own any of the records. I knew about the Nas. I didn't know, you know, how talented he was yet. I mean, that night I heard him play guitar. He was fantastic. But um, I said, "Look, we're moving next month back to New York, uh, back to L.A. This is New York." He said, "I'll come out there and do the record." Next thing I know, we're back in our home in L.A. He's living in the guest bedroom, fucking writing the record. We're jamming in the daytime, and then we start working on this record. He eventually finds his own crib. But um, that's how close it was. And um, that started it, you know what I mean? That jam session, for some reason, clicking, and then us doing Runt. And it was 1969, I'm 15 years old, and I'm doing a record with Todd Rundgren. How'd you end up in Paris then? How I ended up in that is there was this guy named Bobby Hunt, B3 player. He played Bob Welsh and him at a soul band in the early 60s over in Paris. They went over there and they loved them because they played R&B. And then life goes on and da 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 da. But I hook up with Bobby Hunt and I don't know how I hooked up with him, but he said, I'm gonna do this record and I get this guy, my buddy Bob. Okay, so we go up to Marin, up in Frisco, you know, Marin. So we're at Lee Michael's house. Lee ain't there, but somebody knows him. And we got a mobile truck, and I meet Bob Welsh, and we're recording these songs. Mm -hmm. Lee Michaels, I don't know where he was, but in his backyard, he's got a tiger. <laughs> and I'm going, this is off the hook. I record up there for about a week. Obviously, we got along. Next thing I know, he calls me. He's got this record coming out, and we're going to tour. Fine. Um, it was a beautiful person. We got along, sense of humor. And now I'm in Paris, and we're, I'm on Capitol Records with them, and it's, you know... It was a good, it was, it was a good, it was a hard gig. Pre-MTV, we toured Thin Lizzy, Hart, whoever. It was back in 74. And Ginger Baker, Baker Gervitz, Baker Gervitz Army, Ginger Baker and the Gervitz Brothers. I mean, we did package tours. And then we did Big Town 2061. And um, we did that over at the studio up in Hollywood, Total Experience. There's a club called the Total Experience, a black club. And all these soul guys, brothers would be recording, but we recorded there. It was right up the block from Capitol. You know, it was close enough, they'd keep their eye on us. You know what I mean? I know what Bob was doing. And we did the record, and then two or more. So I'd gotten Bell's palsy on this long tour in um, Wisconsin, and we had to cancel in the last two weeks or so, three weeks, two of them, really bad. And um, I get a phone call. I'm recuperating, getting well. Um, Bob is going solo. He went on his way, and I'm sitting there, and I get a phone call. 
Uh, this is whoever I uh, ma manage Bowie. Bowie has now finished Iggy's record. I'd like you to come over to Berlin and get ready for the tour. The day that I got to know him, we had a really nice relationship, me and him. I loved him and I know he loved me. You're still only early 20s. At that point, 21, 22? Something like that, 23. Yep. I go over there and, and we're rehearsing in Hitler's old film studios. Talk about a vibe. This is in Berlin? Yeah, Tangerine Dream, I'm rehearsing next door. Fantastic. And man, this place looks like fing, with those beer lights strung up and creepy. Somebody, there was a vibe there, man. It was So we're rehearsing there every day. And that was the beginning of that with Iggy. And I'd worked with Iggy a little bit on a record, James Williamson, who was a friend of mine and my brothers and my family. The Kill City, we did a couple songs. And David said, who are those guys, those black guys singing? They're great. He said, they're not black, it's the Sales Brothers. He said, that's them? that They sing like that and play? And which album are you touring? That album we were touring, the first one, which was called The Idiot. So you were touring The Idiot. I grew up I grew up on those records. I mean, like, Last for Life, I probably listened to, you know, 100,000 times. Probably like every English guy of my age group. You yeah. You know what I mean? The whole, we, we all started bands because of, you know, because of all the New York and Detroit music. Yeah. That's, I can believe that. I mean, it was a combination of that and the German synth pop bands like Neu and stuff like that. You Fuck stick those yeah. two things together, you end up I with- I got to see Kraftwerk, man. Oh, you did? Oh man, what a fucking show that was. Yeah. We were in Stockholm and they were playing. Yeah. All the original guys. And let me tell you, man, that was some fucking show. Yeah. Oh my God, they were awesome. Do you, there have, was, mem do you have good memories of Hansa? Yeah, but it was so fast yeah. and I worked my ass off. You know, we're talking 10 hours a day or more. Yeah. And made a re I did made my part, which is the beats. Of, until you have a beat, you don't have shit. You gotta have a song, but you, you need the beat. Yeah. I was done in four days. That record was done really fast because we had just come off a tour of 82 gigs in, eight, in 90 days between Europe and America. Had you been touring those songs so you knew them back to front? No, none of none. them. Oh, wow. None of them. They were all written there and Iggy had a couple ideas and they go, yeah, yeah, that chord. The Sales Brothers, that came next? Yeah, it did. We sit down for a year in the basement, the four track. Now we got a manager. He gets us in a great recording studio. We get more than half a record done. Then he helps get the money and we put a band together with some badass players. Brian Ray's one of them, um, Jeff Labus and Lee Thornburg and some badass, you know, from Wayne Cochran's band. I mean, we had horns and the thing. And we got three nights at the Starwood and it is on. It's the last gig, night of the gig. And I go home and my phone's ringing. And I answer it. I come home. She gets us home early. She drives. Well, I got this old Corvette and I'm sleeping. And we get there. I pick up the phone. It's my mom. Your brother's in the hospital. I don't know if he's going to make it. Really? Will you go down to the impound and get the keys out of his car? Because this old lady needs to get it. I go down. He had a 57 Chevy and the front seat was where the back seat used to be. And man, he went through the windshield. There's blood all over the thing. And I had to pull the keys out. And I get to the hospital, and it's like a 12, 15 hour operation. They're operating on him. The doctor's saying the, you know, metaphoric, the, it's burning, the fire's burning. I don't know if we can put it out. I mean, get preparing for the worst. My brother comes out of surgery. He's got a screw in his head to let out the liquid because it's, you know, the brain, so the, the brain up too much. And he's in a coma. My whole life changed overnight and like that. Eventually, he came out of the coma. He didn't know who I was or anybody for a long time. He couldn't walk. His knee was fucked up. He was, bone was broken here. And within a year, he came back. He didn't want to do whatever. And I put my own band together, The Big Nine, which was a horn band on YouTube. You can see it on sale, Big Nine. I put another band together, the horns and shit. It was really crazy. Same thing, 
it wasn't what everyone else was doing, but whatever. That ended that shit. And I don't think I worked again with my brother till Tin Machine. Which is another 10 years later, 89. I got a call, I was in Austin, working on some single for this band I'd done an album on. He called me, ran into David, da 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 da, and thing, when am I coming back? Let's get together and jam, let's get the idea, maybe a band or something. Mm. So you get the call to do, at that point, Tin Machine? Tin Machine, but was yeah. it like, hey, I want to put a band together and make well, a record? Well, they weren't sure. Just, it was just, like, let's we, jam we, kind yeah, of Yeah, we got together and jammed, me and my brother and him. And it was good. My brother pushed the wrong button on the machine and didn't record anything. <laughs> but a bunch of the shit from the first album was put together there. And he said, I got this guitar player. He's really great. I'm going to meet him. And da da da. Next thing I know, I'm in Switzerland. And wow. We're recording, and it's after 10 minutes, it's evident this is not a David Bowie record. This is a band, this is like a garage band with a billion dollar budget, but we're there having fun, and it's back to the basics, and I know David's like it, because he's a little lost. By the time I got over there, I told him what I wanted for the drums, how to do the drums, and then I engineered the shit and got it set up. Tim Palmer walked in a couple days later, and he's very accomplished mixer engineer. We were already, he looked at us like we were crazy. You know what I mean? But we're writing shit in the studio, a song or two or three a day, because all of us had done that shit. I had, my brother had, and Reese, he had his experience, but you know, I'd made a lot of records by the time I hit that. Produced a lot. I was producing. I wasn't even, you know, playing drums a lot. I was producing and editing tape and shit. Then we tried to think of a name. Okay, it's a band. Within a few days, this is a band. I don't know anything yet. And we're writing names down. What would be good for this band? Just like fucking some kids in New Jersey now, right this minute, that are 16, 17 years old, putting a band together. That kind of innocence and hard to find. It's hard to get back to if you want to get back to it. I mean, what memories do you have of making the record? I mean, was it a case of like writing a song and then recording yeah. it? Were you working on yeah. multiple songs at once? I walked in and Reeves was, as usual, like guitar players at 12 at night. He had these loops. He probably would have erased it. I said, hold on, keep that going. The drums are set up, hit the shit. Against this loop. Then I went sections. I'm putting sections over this thing that ain't a song. Next thing I hear, you belong in rock and roll. So when you went back to do the, the other Tim Machine record, what was happening in, you know, did, did you have. Yeah, I was playing Orange County every weekend with Jack Grisham from TSOL. And uh, what's his name? He's in Pennywise now. Randy. He's in Pennywise. He plays bass. Randy was with Jack. And um, I was playing Orange County, Tijuana. Every place I could play. So I did that. Producing. I, went, I was finally got back to producing a couple bands and just hustling my ass off. But it sure did before I learned some things about myself, whether it was through a program, NAAA, or therapy, all of that about myself. And I'll tell you, resentment and anger and misguided, misled truths and, and then sizing shit up for an addict can really spur off some bad shit because you know no one can love me more than I can love me, and no one can hate me more than I can hate me. Believe me, I can hate myself worse than any person could hate me. And I can love myself as much or better than anyone would love me. 2019, you released Get Your Shit Together. Right. Now you so, what was interesting, you released it under the name Hunt Sales Memorial. Right. So before I ask you about the album, why, why is it under the name Hunt Sales Memorial? I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> Buddy Miles, he's in Austin, and he's sick. No one would visit him. He had no, didn't 
he was living at his old lady's brother's house. He didn't have any money. He had a fucked up Cadillac. He was sick. Something was wrong with him. But I'd go out and see him. No one else that people talk shit that no one see him. And, I, and my friend of mine, this guy I know from Detroit, told me terrific work for him. So I remember him coming in town. Yeah, buddy. And, and I'd go out and have lunch with Buddy and hang out with Buddy and, you know. So Buddy dies. And they have the Buddy Miles Memorial and their place is packed with the black jeans and white tennis shoe mother playing f Them changes. Yeah, that uh, and that Hendrix songs. Uh, yeah. And I was disgusted. He's dead? Where were they when he was at home and needed some company? Oh, the memorial. Oh, I'm going to have my memorial now while I'm alive. <laughs> that's where I got the name from. It was so, you know what I mean? I flipped it and went, that, that's f***ed up. Good. That'll be the name of my band. Because I didn't like what I was seeing. You know what I mean? It was really... Sure. It's Tony Visconti out singing Bowie songs. I mean, it's, that, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's just, God bless him, but it's just something creepy about it and lame. So tell us a bit about the album. So I go home. Yeah, okay. And now I got a catalog of songs. I got hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of songs, right? My guitar player's going, you got enough? I got a bunch of these songs on my phone. Ones I had written that year. She says, why don't you do those? My wife said. I said, I'm saving them. For what? You're going to write 50 more songs this week? It. She was right. So I spent like 80 hours a week finishing up these songs. And then before I left home for home after the first session, I was sitting on the couch at Will's house, Sexton in Memphis, Will and Amy, and they were some, they weren't there. And I just, he had a really cool Everly Brothers model guitar, it's in my video. And I came up with one day, and I came up with one other song it like came to me and I always, what I work on is this. Sure. Okay. It's got a VSO, which means it speeds it up or slows it down. It's got compressors in it and it's analog and it's fast. So I get that idea of pressure. I don't sit there for 20 minutes programming something. I don't work that way. It comes out. And sometimes I try to rewrite the lyric. Okay, I got to work on lyrics. It turns out those lyrics that came out the first and only time, they're, the, they're good. It's good. It comes, it's, the record came together real, real fast. And, and like I said, six songs in one day with vocals. The next day I put tenor saxes on this thing and I put some piano shit and I put some shit you can't hear sonically. It's mixed in the background. Then go back. Another six songs, one day's vocals, right after every song. There's video up of me. Have you seen the video of me making It Ain't Easy? I mean, I'm going, get it ready. Come on. Get the fuck. It's not, a, I'm not doing a bit there. It's like, I want to cut this. If I'm feeling that, let's do it. This We did that song twice. The, the second take, they kept. And it was live with me singing. And it was old school. You know, the way they used to record, like, real fast, before they took three weeks for drum sounds and shit. You know what I mean? We just did it really fast. That's what it was. I, you know, I got no Cadillac. I didn't get anything, but I did get a record out. You know what I mean? And I'm really grateful to Bruce, I always will be, that I got something out there. And there's another record in the can now. It sounds, some of it sounds like, what was that music, The Sound of Young America? It sounds like some Barry White Motown shit minus the strings and all that crap. And then there's some other shit on it. It's really dark. You know what I mean? It's real dark and loud. It could be Ronnie James Dio if the music was just a little sicker in another way. Who do you have playing on the record with you? Only difference is a different bass player. I've been through 20 bass players. <laughs> and I got this mother His name is Cornbread. He's badass. And I got him to do the record. We got a little money together, gave him some money. And it wasn't much. It wasn't about that. He wanted to do it. 
we didn't have baseball at the time, so I got him to do it. And um, he did a great job. We did rehearsed, put the songs together. And through various studios, we cut this record. And um, I've wanted to get it out. But when it was time to make a record with Bruce, he wanted to do something. It wasn't like, here, will you put this right? It wasn't that kind of, he wanted to work from, you know, from on up. He liked me and I liked him. We worked together and we worked well together. We complimented each other in the studio. He would do things that I didn't do and I did things that he didn't do. And it was really a good natural thing, man. What a guy, man. I mean, that, that part of it was really cool. I usually don't work with other people. I've started to again. I try to delegate a little more now. I used to do it, get rid of everyone in the studio that worked there and I'd set up the mics and I'd do this and then I'd do that and align the machine. And I burned out finally on that shit and went, let me let other people do shit. If, you, if I don't like it, I can always say, let's change something, but maybe I'll learn something. And you can burn out in the studio really easy. I've seen it. I've seen these guys burn out, man. And I've had, I remember a spring going loose one night in the studio in my brain one night years, years and years ago. And I had fucking doing 10 hours every day, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. Man, something happens to you and you lose your mind. Basically in the uh, 80s and 90s, you're playing a lot of film soundtracks. What, how did you get into that? Because you played American Ninja 2, The Linguini Incident, Slaves of New York, Tape I was Head, in the movie. Dr. Giggles. Yeah? Yeah. So you're in the movie and you get to play, play the music Linguini. as well. Linguini. I was in a movie with Steve Martin. It's always a good thing. Yeah. And it was called The Lonely Guy. And the scene is there's five guys leaving the, the chick he likes room. It's like she slept with the whole rock band. It was me and... Michael DeBars and, and Steve jo and Steve Jones Steve. and my brother and it was one day doing this scene five hundred fucking times, but I got a phone call a few years ago after working with our mutual friend Jose, saying, "Do I want to be in a movie?" I said, "Yeah." So I go back to Austin and my band performs in this scene in a movie and we play a couple songs with an audience and dang, it's groovy. Then I end up acting in it. Nice. Playing this gangster who runs shit in Austin. But the lines are cornball. I said, uh, let me rewrite a couple, okay. And then I'm making shit up. Oh, I like that. So I'm rewriting all the lines that I'm, because you know, and I'm just basically playing myself, kind of, in this movie that's gotten really good reviews at the festivals called The Roommate. I hope you enjoyed that. Please as ever hit the like button. And if you're interested in production, you can sign up for producelikeapro.com. Get on the email list, get a whole bunch of free goodies. And of course, you can join us in the Academy. So long, farewell, Alvida, say au revoir, adios, goodbye. <laughs>